Hello and welcome to Shared.Care's What is Manly radio show and podcast. Men feel more lonely, lost, and not useful in society than ever in history. Males are not attaching to school, work, or women. What it means to be a man appears lost. Is there a framework for being manly that we can unearth? Welcome to Share.Care, an all-inclusive community sharing experience, strength, and hope to create strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. Share.Care communities work toward every individual feeling safe, valued, and heard, free from the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Each episode, founder Damian Andrews explores the principles underpinning Share.Care, and invites expert special guests to share their knowledge so you can easily reap the benefits so many others experience. You hold the choice to create your future. Let it be with strong, healthy, and inspiring relationships. G'day, Craig. How are you going? Good, Damien. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Excited to see your face and have a chat with you. Always very excited when we have our chats. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. This seems like a good topic to to dive into. <laughs> it certainly is. It's certainly a hot topic. There's a lot of discussion around that at the moment. Um, but for the audience, who we have here, this is Craig Gray. And Hen, for two decades, Craig has been an expert um, advisor in conflict management, leadership, and defensive tactics to both private and government organizations. He's a successful entrepreneur, a black belt instructor in Krav Maga, and he helps people communicate more clearly, learn more effectively, and defend themselves more confidently. Have I got that about right, Craig? <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds good. I like it. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, really. I mean, I love the work that you do because you um, you have the Peace Walker is is your um, organization that you talk about, and you talk about from the perspective, uh, particularly for men. Um, that it's about, you know, do most good, least harm that you talk about. And from that perspective, when we talk about guys, there's a lot in the media at the moment about guys being lost, lonely, um, not feeling that they've got a place in the world. If we start more broadly, what have you seen in that in that space? Is that your experience? Is that what you've seen? Guys really don't know what to do now? Well, um, I think you get the gamut out there and the leadership, I think, is important for the leaders to be there. And if you want to say, I was very fortunate as a kid. Uh, my father was a strong mentor for me and my grandfather. And, you know, and that was back in the day when Men could be men, and, and sometimes men went, I think, too far to be too macho. So what I've found in my in my uh, training, when I go out and train organizations and so forth, uh, back 20, 25 years ago, it was really about helping the, the man to understand that, you know, you, you don't have to go overboard in your in your, if you want to say, be macho and being boisterous and and uh, you could be softer. You know, and still be confident and still be a man and still be a good leader and a good protector. But you didn't have to be, you know, the the macho guy who was who was trying to prove himself to everybody and, you know, be this real sometimes uh, jerk or Delta Bravo douchebag. If I, if I can be so bold. <laughs> but, well, but and that's now, the point I, I want to. Yeah, go ahead. So, well, what I've what I've seen over the past at least I would say decade is just the opposite. Mm. I see now that with and not with everybody, you know, every group's a little bit different. But I work with a pretty diverse um, demographic, ranging from military and law enforcement security teams to schools and hospitals and some corporate stuff, and ranging men who are in there you know, 50s, 60s and, and above to 
teenagers. I don't work much with young, young kids, but but I work with teenagers and kids in their young men in their early 20s and, and so forth as well. So it's really the gamut. Mm. And um, I think the two biggest groups that have been a bit lost really were, are the middle-aged guys, believe it or not, the guys who are in their like 30s and, and so forth, mm. and and lower, the younger younger men and the, and the middle-aged guys sometimes. And as if before, you had guys who were a little bit too gung ho, and I was often teaching them, you know, back twenty some years ago, that it's all right to be softer, and it's all right to be in touch with your feelings. It's all right; you don't have to only be this hard, um, perceivably, you know, gung ho kind of man. It's good to be softer. Mm. Now it, it seems to flip flops. Now it's like it's all right to be to be a, a man me you know it's all right to be rough and tumble it's all right to be if you want to say hard around harder is the right the right um mm. term for that but but it's all right to to be what historically we saw men as mm. and you don't have to be overly sensitive you don't have to be overly <laughs> you know um ashamed of being a man <laughs> yeah so. It's interesting that when you talk about being ashamed to be a man, because um, it seemed to be there's a lot of confusion with some of the people that I've talked to around, you know, what do we do? Is it okay to open the door for a lady? Is it, you know, okay to have that chivalrous side? And, and it seems to be a lot of young, and it's interesting you mentioned the younger men, because they seem to be unsure as to what they can and can't do and where they might get in trouble and yelled at. So, and I, I'm being a, you know, using that term yelled at sort of a bit broadly but that seems no, to be what it, yeah it seems to be what they feel that it's if they do something they're going to get in trouble which is kind of ironic because you know to i think it's important for guys to get out and do something and they feel that they can't because they're worried that they're going to get in trouble um is that i mean am i and because that, that's what I've interpreted, is, is that something that you've noticed with the younger people as well, or is it am I is it different where you are? No, I don't think so. I think there is a a certain sentiment of that. Uh, there's a lot of confusion really right now. Mm. So with the with the idea like everything goes, it really is a matter of structure and what what so what is acceptable and what is not acceptable and why. And we get we get in I think confused a lot with intent. Mm. Uh, yeah, interesting. And you know, if I open the door for a lady, why am I doing it? Am I doing it because I perceive her to be lesser than I and weak, or I'm trying mm. to take advantage of her, you know, in a in a sexual way, or or that <laughs> I look down upon her or you know i'm trying to manipulate her or i mean if you think of it from that well why is he doing this intent wise mm -hmm. versus like oh he's trying to be polite to her and he's trying to show courtesy and he's trying to respect her mm -hmm. i think that that idea of where that where that part of the um perception is is very important and and if we are demonizing a group of people, well, it doesn't matter what group you're you're trying to demonize, and you're always looking for those negative things, you're going to find them. You know, yeah. you're going to you're going to find them. That's interesting. You mentioned that because I mean, from my perspective, I hold the door open for everyone, men and women. You know, getting out of an elevator, or let other people go first, or you know, and um, you know, if someone else says no, you go first. Well, I'm not going to sit there and debate it. So it's it's like I'll go, but right. Um, but I'm just wondering is because I've never experienced that happen. Some people have told me that that has happened to them. Um, but I'm just wondering is it when you mentioned the intent is part of that? Do you think how that intent is shown? I'm and, and I'm. I don't know if I'm careful about doing it, but I always, you know, I have that there's a confidence about how I project myself in those situations. There's a pleasantness. I always make sure I've got a smile on my face when I'm doing that. Yeah. Do you think that that could be part of that, that that intent gets misconstrued through possibly lack of knowledge of how body language works, that kind of thing? I don't think so, to be no. honest with you. I, I, I just I, haven't I, come across the the extreme... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I, to be honest with you, I might have, I, I, you know, I can't remember directly, so it probably never happened. But if it has helped happen to me personally, um, 
Yeah, I guess I have had it happen, but it's very rare. I mean, rare. Mm. So I, it's almost like there's a certain urban myth about it. Well, that's what I'm wondering yeah. with that kind of stuff. That, as you say, yeah. is and so yeah. we've got this fear. There's young guys that have got this fear of an urban myth, and I know, you know, the, the movie Urban Legend was one of my favorite movies when I was younger. Oh, yeah. Adults, you yeah, know. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, has it got to that stage where it there is too much of this? urban you know eating the pop rocks with a soda and your gut explodes or your head explodes or whatever yeah, right <laughs> has it Memento, got to- mentos right <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> has it got to that though where it's 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 almost it is because I, i'm i said i'm yet to meet a woman that does not like the door being held open and, and those nice little courtesies and and doesn't take it as an offense they you know they take it as a, a gesture of kindness um and i'm certain i'm not saying that there's not people out there i just haven't had that experience but do you think maybe we this it's become that urban myth type thing where and people are starting to believe an urban myth and and therefore they're paralyzing themselves without actually having a real basis for it i think there's a lot to be said for that uh damien i going to our conversation just before we started recording this Mm. this episode uh i think there is a lot of small specialized groups that get a lot of the attention of our media, you know, social media and mainstream media, because who wants to report and listen to, you know, balanced, <laughs> balanced reporting and balanced well, it seems to be this long form of podcasting type thing is actually getting a bit of traction. Yeah, <laughs> it's cool. I mean, it really is. That is cool. And if you most of the time I've run into much like you, most people are gracious for it. Most people mm. in, you know, appreciate it. Mm. And I'm not saying that it has never happened or it doesn't happen. But, you know, if it happens one out of a thousand times or 10,000 times, I mean, whatever it is, um, mm. and, and we are setting our expectation on that, that the outlier. Mm. Yeah, which seems to be pretty common in today's day and age. You know, mm. we don't we don't go we don't set our expectation on the majority. What ha- happens is we we cater to the you know the the quarter of a percent of people who are angry with things and disruptive, and you know they want to burn the whole institution down. Mm. And unfortunately, that gets all the media attention, both social media and mainstream media. And next thing you know, you think it's this big wave of, well, everybody must think this way because all this is all I'm seeing all over, you know, Twitter and all over Facebook and, and you know, Instagram. And, I, and now I'm starting to hear it on the news and, you know, and, the, and they're reporting on these situations, whether it's whether it's city council meetings whether it's, you know, in, at the school board, but you, mm. then you start to kind of construct this narrative that, and that's saying it's not false, but mm. it's just not as big as it feels like it is because of all the media attention and, and our, we have a tendency, I think, as human beings to focus in on the on the drama, focus in on the negativity, focus in on the, on the fear-based stuff. So, um, there's a mainstream out there, I think, that does not share that narrative. Yeah, because, I mean, it's interesting how we do that. We do focus in on um, things that create heightened emotions, attract us more. And I, I think I told you about my little red light, green light um, experiment that I did where I was thinking I was getting all the red lights because it was frustrating me as I was driving when I was, and I think I was <laughs> 19 or something this is how anally retentive i am or can be um <laughs> i was thinking, you know and then I, I thought something popped in my mind going am i really getting all the red lights so i actually had a notepad with me as i was driving and i and i checked off every light i went through and it turned out to be i was getting way way more green lights i just wasn't paying <laughs> attention to them <laughs> but the green lights i call it the toothache theory right you have 32 teeth in your head i think and you only concentrate on the one that hurts mm. not the not the 31 of them that that are doing what they need to do and they're not in pain so we hyper focus on the on the one and there is another 
and I cannot remember, some of you folks out there can Google it, but I think it's called the reticular system that reticular we have. Reticular activating system, your RAS. There yeah. you go, the reticular activating it's system. A little, it's, little, it's about that big in, your, in the back of your brain, which filters, yeah. Yeah, so the idea that, you know, once we kind of tune into one thing, then, that, then we start seeing that all over. Yeah, it's like and, when you buy a new car, you see that car everywhere. Yeah, even though it was already there. I know my my Honda. Now I see all I can see is my you know gray Honda Accords all over. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I, and I think I have even a Rolls Royce, Royce. and that's <laughs> <laughs> my Lamborghini. Right? Exactly. My, right. my influencer right. Lamborghini. <laughs> you stole my Lamborghini. <laughs> But um, so the interesting thing with that, not only do you see the sim, the similarity thing, the similar things, but also you start compensating for. Let's say, let's say you, um, if anyone went along their day, then I ask them at the end of the day, okay, I want you to tell me how many red cars you saw. Mm. You wouldn't be able to tell me. Yeah. But at the beginning of the day, if I said, okay, I want you to count all the red cars that you can. And at the end of the day, I'm going to give you $500, you know, for every hundred red cars you see. Yeah. Um, my guess is all of a sudden, especially when there's a benefit at the end, my guess is, well, now that burgundy car, well, ah, that's red. <laughs> now that, <laughs> that pink car, well, that's kind of red. You know, so what yeah. happens is not only do you start only seeing those things, but you start, you start looking for them and kind of, mm. if you want to say slanting your perspective a little bit to include more into that group. Mm. So, so if you take that and compile it with, we have a tendency to notice the things that are more dangerous, more fearful, more drama filled, more, you know, <laughs> if you look at all the movies out there, movies that, that have a well-balanced cast and no, no, um, crisis is happening are not popular we like the you know <laughs> we like the drama indiana jones it's this roller coaster ride of adventure and you know yeah. all the stuff going on all the cop shows you know this heck if, if all the officers that i worked with had days like these cop shows there would be nobody left you know <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like, not to say that that they don't see action but holy cow it's ridiculous if you watch the cop shows you know they're it's like they're having a crisis every two seconds both at mm. home and out in the field and you know the the reality is it's not that way typically and uh but look what's happened i don't know when did reality tv shows kind of get kind of get no, no i came a long long time ago from, from my perspective i remember the first big brother it was yeah yeah anyway. and the funny part is is reality shows are everything but they're not reality it's <laughs> fake right yeah. So what they do is, you know, the scripts, they make it, and, and, you, and our logical brains, we know it's fake. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but, being mm. that, but being that we see it, I think we see it, we, we, we want to, to dive into the drama. I, I think yeah. there's a part of us that, that wants to. We want to believe, yeah. I have that, I mean, I do a radio show as well, and um, there's a couple of little voiceovers I do where I do uh, pretend to be somebody else ringing in. And uh, it's, you know, I, I play this one, hello, hello, it's Betty here, hello. And people think it's real. And I'm like, it's just, I'm going, my God. Yeah, I was really, funny. But we do, we want to believe that. Um, how do we, but how do we, you know, when we're communicating with these boys that are lost, how do we, how do we get across to them that, hey, this is not real, this is not real life? What, what can we, what can we do there? I think you just said it. We need good leaders out there that can talk real and mm. authentic and who are confident in themselves and they're balanced. Yeah. Right. My dad is a man's man. He's he just turned or he's going to be turning 79 years old. It's amazing mm. that he's almost 80 years old. It's my mom and dad's birthday. My mom's birthday is today. And, and then. Uh, oh, happy birthday to him. Yeah, she's 78. So. Awesome. Um, wow. Awesome. Yeah. She's she. I mean, I cannot. I don't know. I, I cannot express how fortunate I feel that I have had the parents that I have had. And, uh, mm. um, you know, you don't have any control over that. No, but no, I, I, mean, I, I, I won so. the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really did. And I, I'm more thankful for them every day. But, you know, there are times in my life that I, I didn't think I was because, <laughs> you know, I was 
they they are preventing. Is that about me. when you're a teenager ish? Maybe like right, <laughs> right. You know, it's like they're doing they're doing when you knew good everything, things for me, <laughs> but I didn't see it at the time. Yeah. Well, my point is, is my dad. My dad is a man's man. He's he's marine. He was very not very emotionally available, mm. but he loved me. But he was very stern. Didn't say a lot. Um, was he the you know the perfect role model of how you should communicate with your kid and and so forth? No, he was not. We are all flawed in in different ways. Mm. Uh, but I knew that he loved me. He communicated, and and as he's gotten older, he he when he um, got closer to his retirement, and that he started opening up more. And mm. I mean, granted, by that time I was an adult, but. Uh, my point is, is he was a strong male figure mm. that showed me as well as my grandfather did, showed me what it was to be a man, showed mm. me a, a lot through his actions, not through his words. I mean, if you went, I could probably fit all, all the words that he told me in a very, very, very short, <laughs> probably pamphlet <laughs> over the years, not, not in the book, but he showed me by living mm. and by unconsciously me observing him. Mm. And then at times when we had our heart to heart talks and all that, they were very short and not a lot of words were exchanged. But mm. I also got I also got the meaning that, you know, if I stepped out of line, there'd be consequences, too. Yeah. And but he expected me to take on the role of being a man. And he expected for me to do that early on. Now, what what was that role of being strong, of being fair, of Sharing your strength with people who needed help, not mm -hmm. bullying and intimidating people, but being able to throw down if you had to. And that throwing down meant physically, meant verbally, meant standing up for yourself and not being a doormat. But you don't have to be a peacock to do it, right? You don't have to be like, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, look, look how tough I am. Actually, I mean, yeah. if anything, he was the opposite of it. He's the one who started me in martial arts when I was just a just a young, young man. And um, back in the day where they didn't have kids classes in martial arts and so forth. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things my folks always said, not always in a, in a, in a positive way, but I could you, like, you don't tell anybody, mm -hmm. don't even slip up. Don't tell anybody you're training. Don't tell anybody, you know, don't, don't lead on that. You're, mm -hmm. that you're doing that kind of stuff. And they, they were very private people, uh, a little bit, a little bit extreme, but, mm -hmm. um, the, so it raised a bunch, of, a bunch of guilt for me if I slipped or anything. I'm like, oh, I, I, I said something. <laughs> <laughs> but we're like, we're going to have something from our parents to take to a psychiatrist, don't we? <laughs> right. But uh, but he was, he was uh, the epitome might not be the right term. Obviously, he's my father, and I respect him. And he has flaws, and he had flaws, mm. things that mm. he did not do perfectly. Yeah. But he was a very positive male role model that we don't always get and we don't always get nowadays either. I was, I was wondering from that perspective, and I wanted to ask you that, and I forgot that your dad was actually in the military as well, but I know you work yeah. a lot with the military. And from my, because they talk about, you know, this macho manly thing, um, and that's a stereotypical, they, they use the word norm, and I, I, I really despise that term, the norm. It just seems to generalize everything into one thing, which I don't think that's an appropriate way of, of dealing with it. But they're talking about, you know, the norm is that men are this, you know, stoic, um, you know, no, express no feelings or anything like that. Don't ask for help. And, I mean, you talk about your dad you know, from the, and you use the words. You know, he he was talking about being fair, about using your strength to help those in need, um, and I love that because we wrote that into the code as well as as you're aware of, and I know you have that from the Peace Walker perspective as well. You know, most good least harm um, perspective, and the what I'm found interesting because from my experience, when they talk about men being you know this macho thing, this that stand you know. I think the best definition I heard of macho was, um, you know, a guy that gets a vasectomy and then drop, jogs home. Um, I thought that, <laughs> you know, that, that that's macho, you know. I know, um, I know when I got mine, there was no jogging afterwards. I had, a, <laughs> I had, uh, what is it, the, the frozen peas between my legs for weeks. 
<laughs> but I, I just I found it fascinating that when I was in because I was at the SAS, which is Australian Special Forces, I was posted there, and the guys there <clears throat> were you know they were super tough, and as you would know from Green Berets and SEALs and stuff like that that you deal with, those guys are really tough as well. But they weren't you know it was a quiet confidence. They could yeah. you know if you didn't know if you took out you know took them off the military base, put them in any civilian area just in civilian clothes most of them didn't even they weren't well built in the sense of you know no. bodybuilder um but they were lethal well i mean one of the most lethal guys close a friend of mine there um he his hobby was sewing he took in my pants when i lost weight you know and so and i just yeah but this is the thing that i'm, I'm wondering about when we're talking about you know that this getting lost um is this you know again the minority view. That's why I don't like the word norm when it because because from what I've experienced is the real tough guys like your dad. Um, they it's more about a calm, quiet that you don't know. But as you said, they can throw down if they have to. But that's very rare that you know that happens. Most of the time, it's about how do you avoid that situation. Absolutely, and and that has been exactly my experience too, Damien, with all the. Special ops guys that I've worked with, um, both in the States as well as other countries, Israel, done a lot of work with Israel. Most of the bad rear end mofos that I know, the baddest guys that I know, the, you know, the most mm -hmm. lethal guys are the, usually, and not always, but most of the time they're the quietest or the most like subdued. Mm -hmm. They don't want attention directed to themselves. They're humble. They're, um, Many of them are very nice. Now, not to say that that's only the situation, not to say, but most of the time that that is the case, at least in my experience. Mm. So that's what I was wondering from that perspective. Again, that communication, I mean, from, you know, it's you know, having that quiet confidence because it seems to be, as I said, it's, it's more about assessing that situation. I think from that perspective as well, because I look at it, in, I mean, I have a um, a bearded dragon as a pet, and I know if, if when that is freaking out, it'll puff itself up, and yeah, yeah. yeah, and and that's what I find, you know, in that same scenario. If you're out and and I've been out in bars and things like that, it'll be the guy that you know puffs himself up, you, you know, because I have that background. You're looking, and going, yeah, you, you're really scared, aren't you? <laughs> is when you and that's it, right? Yeah. You know, um, that's a good analogy because I think that's true. It's it's the ones usually that are the loudest that are often the most not not even unconsciously, but I think they're the ones that are the most unconfident, very consciously inside of themselves. Well, you would know too from that perspective as well. As soon as you start engaging that that um, primal part of your brain, your thinking goes out the window, and so you can't really you have got a very narrow perspective on things so you can't assess what's going on you can't you know determine you know make those judgments anymore um but here's, yeah. here's an interesting i think an interesting point that i just mm. thought of you were talking about the, the bar mm. scenario and the, and the bearded dragon <laughs> <laughs> if you look and this is because of our enhanced social mm. um connections that we have through social excuse me, through social media now, and we're online all the time. But if you look at a predator, mm. when they are hunting, mm. they are what? They are calm. Mm. Their heart rate is level. Mm. Their breathing is level. Yeah. They are confident. Mm. They are quiet. Yeah. They are you know, stalking. They're, you know, they're, mm. they're getting ready for the kill. They don't want to activate their prey too early because mm -hmm. they want to get literally a jump on them. Yeah. Now, so if you take someone who's really serious, you know, mm -hmm. they're not making a big scene. They're not all activated. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take when, when the animals are social and they're, especially if they're fighting for what, for women, or mating rights, I should say, mating rights, mm. or territory, mm. or food within inner species, you know, within their own pack. What is mm. it? It's just the opposite, right? They're mm. puffing up. They are 
they're putting on a big show yeah. and they really don't want to kill one another, but they want to dis- they want to establish their dominance within the group and to mm-hmm. get the, you know, to get the mating rights and to get the, the first dibs at the food and the water mm-hmm. and say, this is my spot. You don't come here. Yeah. So I, I think this is what you're seeing more in our environment now is we we are in a very quasi realistic situation that we've developed for ourselves in a social manner with online stuff so now everything is very very much um it it, it doesn't turn off mm-hmm. meaning we're trying to get everybody's attention all the time i want to get those like likes i want to be you know i want to be whether it's for money, you know, I'm the I'm the next influencer. Look at my Lamborghini. Look at my big house that I rented, and but I'm telling you that I own, and you know, or if you are being, whether it's a man or a woman or, or whatever, an individual, how do I gain dominance? Mm. And if I can make you believe that, you know, what you're doing is not right. And that you need to bow down to this other group and it becomes toxic. Yeah. Does that like from that side of things, when you're looking at it, I mean, part of that, as you say, in the, it, it's that puffing up and trying to show this dominance. And then when you put that, I mean, cause a lot of people out there are not on social media. <laughs> you know, I'm not on, well, I'm a little bit, but not really. Um, there's but a lot we're of- still affected by it. Yeah, I mean, even though even though you're you're particularly not on it, how many billions of people are? Now, and that's the point I'm getting to from that side of things. Where you know, is it a case if someone and this one, I'm trying to get to the point of you know, a person for a guy, if they like themselves, if they're confident with who they are, uh, does it really matter what anyone else thinks? I would say, I mean, yes and no. Mm. At the end of the day, it kind of—I mean, it does. But it's I—we're group speed, we're a group animal, right? Yeah. And and this is how we get our norms too. Of like, mm. if if I'm in a group of people, let's say as a kid, and I want other kids to play with me, well, there's a protocol for that, right? I yeah. can't just be totally into myself and selfish and all this but i also if i'm an outlier i'm gonna be lonely too and there's the gamut i mean it's not one or the other but we learn through interaction of what's kind of acceptable and what's not acceptable and the pecking order and all this but it's very i think it's more extreme online mm. and and you can just like jump to a different group and that's why I think what happens is one of the reasons why we get really like a neo-tribalism mm. because I don't have to get along with everybody. I'll just go over to this group and I don't have to really interact with you. Like, for instance, if you and I were not seeing eye to eye, but I treated you with dignity and respect, whether it's online or not, mm. we have a much better chance of getting to the bottom of it. Yeah. Yeah. If I didn't show you respect online i could just shred you and i wouldn't care right yeah. or, I, or i get off on it right you know it mm. feels good to me that there, it, it kind of trips that little wire in me that we all have mm. you know that you kind of keep tabs on i showed them even though yeah they probably made, you know, know, demonizing <laughs> the other person <laughs> but if this was live and you and i are face to face it's much harder to do Mm. it's definitely much harder to do if you are being a well-adjusted rational caring individual who has good boundaries and a good skill set of, of communication skills and so forth and you could treat me with empathy meet me where with what i'm at where i'm at but still still have our differences and still communicate that you didn't agree it would be harder for me to continue just to rip you apart mm. You know, with that personal interaction. Now you can still do it online, but it's really, really difficult and uh, and time consuming. I can remember at the early days of when I was getting into social media for business purposes mainly. I would get trollers, mm. and I used to engage them personally. Right? If I mm. got a troller in the very beginning, I would use, I used to like instant message them or direct message them and say, "Hey, 
what's going on, man? I mean, you you know, you put up this really scathing comment, mm. and I just you know, I'm kind of curious on why you know, yeah. and nine nine times out of ten, I could get them to come around. Mm. But it took so much effort <laughs> that I don't do it anymore. I just I delete them. I, you know, if you don't have any constructive to say, I am not going to sit and spend the time and effort that it takes to turn you around like that because there's too many of you, and I just don't have the patience for it. But but my point is, is if if you really put the time in, most of the in my direct experience, anyways, most of those people could be turned around to eat to even if it was well, we just can respectfully disagree. Yeah, so from that, because again, I'm still trying to work out how to you know, structure that for people, like you say, the, the 30s and under that don't know that. Is it a case of we we just need, as you said, you had a really good role models in your, your father and your, your grandfather. Um, do we need more of those? Well, we, we talked about we do need more of those role models, but how do we get that out there and how do we get that getting attention, do you think? Well. Radio shows and podcasts like this one. <laughs> I know I'm serious. I mean, you know, yeah. a little self serving, you know, but um, but no, yeah. it's true. It, guys like you, guys like myself, mm. there's there's many many men that I know um, who are well balanced, mm. who are strong, and they do project themselves as a strong role model. And we need to have more of these men step up. And put and be put into positions, put themselves into positions voluntarily to be mentors and to help. But th- nothing crazy. Just go be a strong role model. Mm. You and if you can, and if you choose to and want to, do it more on a if you want to say on a formalized basis. And it doesn't have to be like on your business card or anything. <laughs> but reach out, I guess is what I'm saying. Reach out if you see the opportunity to reach out to these young men um, mm. and mentor them. Right. Now, granted, you can only put it out there. They've got to take you up on it, which is fine. Don't shove it down people's throats, so to speak. But mm. don't be afraid to A, lead from the front, set the pace. Yeah. B if you find the opportunity to where you can more formalize that relationship, maybe it's just getting together for over coffee. Matter of fact, I've got like this week, I've got at least three meetings and I'm doing just coffee with, with some, some guys to uh, do exactly that. Mm. Be available, make yourself available to them. Uh, they're looking for guidance, but not in a preachy luxury way. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned because they are looking for guidance. And what you mentioned before, you mentioned about your dad that, as you said, you know, with everything that he told you, you could put in a pamphlet. But what he showed you, how he lived, was much more stronger. Do you think, you know, and I know this is being stereotypical, but do you think that's what guys need as opposed to, you know, having the education? They they actually need to have, you know, the, the role models where they see the actions. Yes. And they, and they also have to feel it. Meaning uh, there is a, there is in our schools anyways, mm-hmm. I don't know about you folks over in Australia, but definitely in the United States here. And the funny part, once again, I think it's a smaller faction that gets a lot of attention. I don't think it's because when I, I teach teachers oftentimes. Um, I've actually got a few in this uh, retreat that that we're doing right now, mm. and uh, but I deal with a lot of schools, mm. and most of them are pretty well balanced. But but you wouldn't think so when you see the media. Mm. But there is a bit more of a culture now i think of not letting young men be young men uh meaning for instance zero tolerance policies it's a huge point but we have zero tolerance policies over here in the states for many schools basically what happens is if you are any kind of 
physical engagement, everybody everybody gets either expelled or detention mm-hmm. or or whatever. And and it doesn't work. <clears throat> yeah. And also, I don't think that it's that it's right to do it that way. It, mm. it doesn't. I, I, it incentivizes it incentivizes the person to not stand up for themselves, mm. and it also incentivizes people to rely upon a system that does not work for them, and they know it, and they get frustrated by it. Meaning. Okay, so if you say zero tolerance, but you then you then you structurally have to protect me from you know the threats that that I that you won't allow me to protect myself from. Mm. And being a kid is a great time to learn how to deal with conflict. It's a great time to learn all those emotions that you have inside of you. And and young men and young women have different emotions that they're dealing with in ways in ways that they that they express them and they feel them. Um, so oftentimes what, what I see is like young men being told, well, by the media a lot, not even by individuals, but by the media a lot, which they take a lot of their information from is it's wrong to feel this way, right? The aggression, it's wrong to feel this way. Maybe the, the, you know, your sexuality, it's wrong to feel this way your frustration it's wrong to feel this way that you like roughhousing yeah. it's wrong to feel this way that you're physical yeah and is that pretty feel strong over in america that, What's that is that pretty strong projection over in america that you have that seems issue? To be. it's yeah okay seems to be um well and again we're we're still living in an age of participation awards and you know you don't play dodgeball because you know there's some kids that do better at it than others um well my my view in that too is like well well you don't if you have a c student and an a student you don't knock the legs out from underneath the a student because hey you're more intellectual than the c student mm. <laughs> right no you help the c student become an a student mm. And they may never be an A student, but the same thing holds true in the physicality part. So you've got this kid who who is not physically strong. <clears throat> so rather than just decimating him all the time in in uh, the physical manner in school, you know, you help him to get stronger. But in the same token, you don't give him an out saying, well, we're not going to do these things because, you know, it just it, 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 it ensues more bullying. Well, it can if there's not good leadership. If there's good leadership, no. Yeah, because that, I mean, and you've, I mean, you mentioned martial arts and, um, oh, you'll be happy to know my, my son actually got his black belt just recently too. So Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah, so he worked really hard and, and he actually wasn't going to get it. And then the yeah, sensei said that he, um, in the last week, he triggered something, did something, did some extra work and, and got it over the line and, and got that. Um, so yeah, so that's yeah. awesome. It's a big accomplishment. So congratulations to him. He did. Uh, I know what it takes to achieve that, and it's it's awesome. It's good. Yeah, exactly. And and that's why I wanted to come from that perspective of going because I look at what's taught in those spaces, and it's not about you know crushing the other person. It's what you're we're talking about. It's about helping and and having a balanced life using your strength for good. Um, you know, the sensei talks more about helping, you know, help your mum around the house and, you know, well, mum and dad yeah. um, help around the house and, you know, make your bed, all that kind of stuff is what's talked about. You know, go and do the dishes, go and do, you know, take the bins out. Um, don't be, you know, you don't be there, get your homework done. Um, and there's a lot of that talk in the in the lessons about, you know, self-responsibility. And is that really what we need in the education system as opposed to like you're saying you know it's trying to restrict achievement but to actually encourage people to be more responsible in their behaviors i think so and then in the right ways um for instance when you're in my opinion again i'm not i'm not in the scholastic world and in that manner of teaching k through 12 um so obviously take what I say with the perspective 
of that. It's a, it's an outsider. You know, mm-hmm. I consult schools, but so it's probably easier for me to say, but if you are going to be a teacher, especially K through 12, but I, but I would, yeah, definitely K through 12 is you're, you're a personal development coach as well for kids. Mm-hmm. I don't care what you teach. I don't care if you're a coach on the football team, soccer or, or American football, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Got to clarify cool. these things. Some people get really upset about that. <laughs> right, exactly. I don't know about that. I want you to get a bunch of, don't want you to get in a bunch of trollers because the American doesn't know what football is. <laughs> um, or if you are a math teacher or history teacher or social studies or whatever, uh, first and foremost, in my opinion yes the scholastic aspects are important Mm. so it's not an either or it's a both and Mm. but even more important is the development of that child with personal development um, type things Mm. so you're developing a young human you're not just teaching a math or history or whatever and same thing goes with the sports content. Um, I really, there's some coaches out there that I really respect. I, I really respect the coach who, you know, for his little league or junior high team or high school team, you know, when his players are being unethical and whatnot, that he benches them or he yeah. pulls his team off the field because they're not playing, you know, with um, sportsmanship. Mm. And, you know, Parents lose their minds on this. Yeah. They are too into the game, and they're not thinking about the development of their of their uh, kids sometimes. Mm. And the other portion of that, too, is learning to win is beneficial, but mm. I think learning to lose is more beneficial. Mm. And what that... What learn from losing both inside of yourself and also you know learning then to turn that into uh forward progress whether it's specific to whatever it is hey if i get a bad grade on a paper that's feedback yeah if i lose a game that's feedback and it's internal right you've got to you've got to work that out internally but you also it's it's it gives you feedback on how to be how to get better at that too you know whatever that is whether it's a it's a sporting event or it's a you know term paper or an academic class so denying our our people our young people that learning experience is detrimental especially later in life where there seems to be some folks who don't think that there's consequences for actions and they don't know how to deal with with the difficult conversations. I work with a lot of individuals who have a really hard time with anything but things they agree with. Mm. If they agree with you and they're on the same page, you're good to go. It's all, you know, unicorns and rainbows. You're, you're great. Yeah. But once once we have a differing opinion, the discomfort level rises to the degree that they don't know what to do with that, to manage that, and to be able to communicate in an effective way or handle those, themselves in an effective way that, you know, would allow them to continue to change that situation into a beneficial one. Mm. And because I love what you're talking about there about having the ability to well to learn from failure, and obviously if you, everyone gets a participation trophy, um, you're not getting that opportunity. Um, and I mean that can be a big driver as well. I mean I know from my son's experience early on when he was doing karate, um, he hadn't done the work for one of his earlier gradings. Um, I didn't push it i thought you i'm gonna let you fail this um right. i'm not gonna do it and and he did everyone else passed except him and and so as soon as we walked out of that i said how did that feel <laughs> it wasn't like happy. crap dad <laughs> <laughs> it was like i said well did you do the work and he goes no and it was um but how i mean because you mentioned about the parents there how how much of that is on the parents i mean to to have that you know have the 
because you can say all you want at school, but if the parents are at, at home going, you know, this sucks and, you know, you deserve to get a trophy and, you know, how much of that is on the parents? That part of it is the parents, right? The same thing because the parents are going to make the decisions at the schools too. You know, if the parents come in and say, what do you mean these kids aren't going to get trophies or, you know, mm. we don't declare a winner and a loser. This just isn't right. Mm. So the parents should hypothetically be setting the pace both with their kids and collectively with the schools. Mm. Yeah, because it's interesting how that happens. And it's it's kind of, I guess it's a little bit frustrating as well because, I mean, for my son, he goes to, you know, a private school and and their tradition is there's no way, there's no participation trophy here. <laughs> but it's all very much encouraging as well. They're encouraging to learn and grow and, and things like that. Um, but that's not the same with all the schools. And I'm just wondering how we get that across. Is it because you know, when you look at, and I've talked to some people in the education system and talked about, you know, teaching that respect, learning from failure, and go, oh, yeah, we're working on it. But it's, I mean, it seems to be a slow process, but maybe that's just the way that needs to be because that's the way those those institutions operate. Um, I, you know, but I think we all get frustrated with how slow government can be. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, any any kind of big ship, I think, whether it's a big corporation or it's a big government or it's a big society, I mean, um, we can be aware, for instance, uh, like my kids go to a small charter school mm. and um, they're very responsive to, they don't, they're very responsive to the, the needs of the, the parents and the wants of the parents Um and the kids for that matter, but it's, mm. it's a very healthy overall. I say it's a healthy learning environment because of those things. And, uh, you get some of these larger institutions, some of the big public schools, you know, there's a, there's a culture. And, uh, if, if it's not, if that culture isn't matching the, the culture that you want to raise your kid in, then there can be challenges. Yeah. But it's hard to change it, right? And also, back to one of our the former point of our conversation, you get a very small faction making a lot of noise, mm. and we tend to cater to them. And then it's like, well, wait a minute, you know. So, so two people out of the school are opposing, you know. In this case, getting declaring a winner or loser in this in this uh, sport and all of a sudden that's the now that now we're going to make that decision based upon those two people who are complaining mm. that's a good point uh, it's and, good. a lot more people are speaking up now that you know because i mean especially i've been surprised how many women are speaking up and, and don't like participation trophies especially if they've got sons it's i mean i think they're fine for very 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 young kids mm. but once you start getting like you know junior high uh, in, probably even before that you know late elementary people i mean there's a difference between you know not encouraging people um and you know, in, and everyone saying you know you know, oh, you're all performing equally um but like i mean as einstein said if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree it's always going to fail um, right. We need to be a little bit more mindful about you know what it is that you know. We're, I mean, I mean, if the child is short and you want to be playing basketball, you know, and, you yeah, know good luck. <laughs> but it's yeah, exactly. it's like yeah, encouragement, but you know, be mindful that this is an additional restriction that you're going to have. Um, right. I mean, well, taking point, you know, the whole. I don't know how far down this path we want to go, but the, with the whole transgender movement in sports and how that's yeah. really disrupting the the sport community especially uh on uh you know the, everything from the professional level to the school you know the school level colleges and the high schools but obviously more on the regards of colleges and uh, definitely in, in professional sports um biological men going and competing with women i already know how that's going to turn out so yeah, yeah, I don't think it's. Uh, I mean, because uh, I think the Olympic Committee or some major sporting body just ruled that yeah, that that's not happening anymore. Yeah, uh, and I think we're going to see more of that. Which I, I don't really care. You can you can declare yourself whatever you want to declare yourself. I, I don't really have a problem with that. Yeah, but but when it comes to bio, biology, is biology how many chromosomes you have in comparison to your competitors? You know, it's like you you can't. 
how you want to act socially, you know, you can do what you want. But um, but some of these decisions that we're making, I think you're going to see more of that, like yeah. um, the decision that the Olympic Committee had made. And mm-hmm. I think it needs to be that way. I wouldn't want one of my girls competing with uh, a, a boy at the same age, um, you know, as if he was a she. Yeah. At a high well, school, there, like, I mean, there's a like you say, bio, there's a there is a strength differential in any of those sports where that plays. Absolutely, it's it's just, overall. I mean, do you get do you get some anomalies? Yeah, sure. But uh, again, the outlier you have some outliers. But overall, mm. men are in, in the case of like sports, <laughs> men are bigger, men are stronger. Typically, not to say you couldn't have a very weak man and a very strong woman. You know, mm-hmm. and you pit those two together, or whatever. But uh, but overall, as a group, um, and it's not that they couldn't compete together under certain regards. But if you're going for, you know, then they, then you don't need, I guess, an MBA and a whatever the the WNBA, you know, mm-hmm. over here in the states. You just have, you know, everybody's in the NBA, and I know who's probably not going to get chosen. You know, <laughs> if you're trying for tryouts, it's going to be dominated by men. That's yeah. why you have a WNBA, yeah. you know, because there are differences mm-hmm. and it's all right to have those differences. And then, you know, in the other other half of that is there are probably a lot of people, I'm sure, especially of religious slant, that are very that are very particular about, you know, the gender discussions and all this. Mm-hmm. But there's I think there's even more people who will probably have more the ideal of like do whatever you want right mm. if that's what you want but but why not why but it starts getting a little bit um interesting when when you're trying to take those perspectives and push them in the public arena mm. to make public decisions yeah and i don't know where that's all going and how when we're on that topic of you know uh, the the um you know trans you know, same sex couples um that kind of thing the from that side of things there's a discussion about you know the it, again that word norm that it's you know it's a norm that men are homophobic that macho men are homophobic um you know and I struggle with that because that's never been one of my best friends from when I was young he was gay um. And, you know, he was open about it when he was, was, well, we were close friends and he was open about it to me. And it's like, well, I'm not, but <laughs> I'm flattered that you're, you're hitting on me, but I'm, I'm not gay. Right. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, that happened to go, a guy buys me a drink or something. It's like, I appreciate it. I, I, I like being attractive, but you know, I don't swing that way, but, uh, but thanks for the drink. <laughs> yeah. And it was, and so, and, and I've had lots of, and, and with my, I mean, when I was a bit older and going to bars, going to my, my, um, going to the gay bars with my friends was great because there's lots of women that went there to hang out with gay and I'm a straight guy. And was, I was right. like, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, Cause there's all these, all these women hanging out in the, 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 um, the gay bar because, you know, and, and with all the, the gay guys and, and then there was me there being the straight guy. And there's, there's all these women that are actually, Oh, you're very sensitive. And it's like, Oh yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it goes um, back yeah. to what we were saying with with your confidence level. I am mm. totally confident with myself. I've had I have straight friends. I've got gay friends. I, you know, I have folks I know who are trans um, that we you know get together mm. and talk and have coffee and and all this. And uh, being that I am clear on who I am, mm. I don't expect you to be me. I'm confident. I'm not judgmental as far as as long as you're treating me and others respectfully, we can differ on uh, pretty much everything. And we can actually even still be friends. Mm. Um, I value people as human beings, and I recognize that we do have differences. But the differences are often details. But if I make that detail the main thing, 
you start to run into problems because then you have to be exactly that. You know, if the main thing is that you're, you know, you believe this particular way, or the main thing is that, you know, you are in, in this social economic stratus, you know, mm. or the main thing is that you have this, or the main thing is that, well, then I'm, I've got to replicate that main thing, either, either ostracize you if you're not in it or force you to be a part of it. And you're missing the point. The point is the main thing to me is you're a human being. I'm a human being. I'm going to show that respect. And I'm not going to try to force and judge other details. I may have to assess like if it becomes a, if it becomes a safety issue Hmm. circumstance, but most things are details. That's because that's really cool. Yeah. Go ahead. I was, you know, I was just wondering from that perspective in your part of the world, because and and maybe I'm missing something because in my part of the world, you know, the whole you know, this because I talk about you know toxic masculinity. And we'll get into that in a minute, but you know, part of that is being homophobic, and and from my experience, I don't recall that as being a norm. You know, they they talk about you know the male norm is that you're homophobic, and it's like. I I know I can't think of I mean I'm sure I've met people that were but I really can't think that that was the norm that that's how guys think is that similar from your perspective or or is it different or is it generally that guys are homophobic my, my experience and it, it keep take it with a grain of salt my experience is skewed because it's my experience yeah and you know 52 years old but I would say there was a lot of homophobia when, especially when I was younger. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, games like Smear the Queer, you know, Smear the Queer game is, right? It's, uh, Never it's heard of kind it. of like, <laughs> kind of like rugby where they'd be usually play with some type of a ball, football mm. or whatever kind of a ball. And if you got, if you got the ball passed to you, everybody like just piled, you know, pile drive into the ground, they would all tackle you and, yeah. you know, but it's called Smear the Queer. Right. Or another one, if you were in band at uh, at school, band fags, or you're a fag, was not, you know, fag, not cigarette, but, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, actually, but, we had lollies here called fags. They were actually cigarettes, and they changed the name from fags to fads, and then they got oh, rid of oh, together because you shouldn't funny. be teaching kids how to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there was a lot of derogatory um perspective mm-hmm. towards homo, homo, homosexuals um definitely when i was younger and it's and i was kind of the case case in point you know when i was talking earlier i was kind of the outlier mm. because i didn't care i had i had gay people who i knew i had gay friends from a rather early age and mm-hmm. i was confident enough and sometimes i'd stick up for them you know when somebody would say cross you know cross words to them Mm. Uh, because I'm like, hey, listen, just leave them alone. They're like, who are you? Are you, are you gay too? It's like, you can call me whatever you want, man, but just step off. And I was <laughs> strong enough and I had the skills enough verbally and physically that mm. and you know, I had you know, you know, a reputation, I, I guess, of being that, you know, just kind of a balanced guy that people wouldn't mess with me. Mm. I'm talking high school, you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure people know. still wouldn't mess with you, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, these types of situations to where back then they were done live in person. Yeah. They weren't done online, you know, but, but I think in my opinion, at least yeah. in the United States, there was a big homophobic um, mm. norm, if you want to say for many, many years, I think that's changed in the past. Now being, I mean, being gay is kind of boring. <laughs> You know, that no, nobody really cares that much anymore. But it, was, it wasn't always that way. Well, case in point, Michigan here just recently passed the law to where same-sex marriages. That probably is only maybe seven years old. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah. So they didn't and, have out of the same similar, that, I, I think we've got the same law here. I haven't really looked at it. Um, but, it, again, it's recent. Um, but it's just... I said, and because I had a friend who, as I mentioned before, my my best friend was that um, 
we were kind of ostracized, both of us, but not because he was gay that I recall. It's because we were just didn't do, you know, we, we weren't, oh, what were we? I don't know, we we're just doing something different. Um, to what the you know we were in a small country town and and it wasn't and I was like so what I don't really care what you think um, for you know I was fortunate to have a, a mother which I hated you know she was always doesn't matter what people think and she'd wear these horrible beanies that I hated and it's like don't do that that's embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was in 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 one way I was embarrassed by that but the same token too I was there was you know I did my own thing and didn't really worry about it too much. Um, mm. Well, maybe I did. I mean, we look. We yeah, you know, our memory changes over time. I guess it does, right? We we remember it differently. I don't think I did. I mean, mm. uh, for the most part, and I you know we just I had a class reunion maybe mm. um, four years ago. I think graduated yeah. in 1988, and uh, so we went, and it was what must have been our 30th year. The last one mm. was our 30th anniversary. 30th, is that mm. right? Or yeah, thirtieth last one I went to. So this year would be our, it would be thirty fifth this year. Um, mm-hmm. But when I went to the thirtieth, you know, I brought my significant other, and she and I have been together for about just shy of ten years. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so she know, started to, she's known me since my forties. Mm-hmm. So she found it very interesting when when I went in with you know these people that I knew from some of them from elementary school. Yeah. And she was amazed that, you know, she's like, holy cow, you really have been this way for like your whole life, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with what I do and, and how I interact with people. Yeah. And and uh, that, that's my memory of it. But but everybody mm. she talked really reinforced that that that's always has been kind of my way of. Mm. And, and again, I credit that to my father, my grandfather, and my martial arts instructors. And obviously, I had probably had a predisposition uh, with my personality. But but yeah, this this idea of just being balanced, confident, strong, and able to have other people's backs for the most part. I was still a kid, not to say I was mm. perfect, but that has been the norm. But but I will say with the homosexuality part of it. I would say there was a stigma for a very long time mm. that they fought. I think they mean, you know, the homosexual people of that slant fought to, to become more of a normal, um, accepted, accepted as in, in the whole. But here's the thing that I think occurs, and I've seen this in individuals, and I've mm. seen this in groups of individuals. If you are victimized or feel as if you're being victimized, and let's say you fight to the point to get to the the degree to where you have now gained your autonomy to a certain degree, right? Whether it's an individual, right? I, I I'm the class bully, and now all of a sudden I go to martial arts and I start speaking up for myself, and, and I change through a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and and discomfort. I change my my demeanor to where now people are starting to respect me. Mm. Because I'm standing up for myself, and maybe I had to throw down with a couple of people, whether it's physically or verbally or emotionally or whatever it was. But I'm standing up for myself, so I'm not I'm not taking it on the chin anymore. Mm. A lot of people and groups of people will then become the bullies, mm-hmm. and you see that I think nowadays with some of these smaller special interest groups that have gained a certain amount of social power. Now they're using it like a club and beating people over the heads with it because they haven't gone beyond. And if they have good mentorship, mm. they will get beyond that and yeah. then they'll bounce it back out. And I've seen this with, with people, right? So it happens at, at the, our academy all the time, but I've seen it with individuals too. But if they, they have to have the right mentorship, Typically, it'll, it'll, I think it'll happen faster if they have the right mentorship of their mentor going, well, now you're being a knucklehead. Mm. You know, you being able to stand up for yourself doesn't give you the right then to go beyond that to now you've become the bully. Yeah. And I think you're seeing that, in my opinion, you're seeing that with individuals, but you're seeing it with groups. Mm. You're seeing it with individuals. And I, in my opinion, we've seen it over here in, in many things, right? 
Um, for instance, seem to be like, the outliers again. It's not the the, the norm. It's yes. just the ones that it's people that have gone, um, you know, too far, gone too far, and they get the attention. But that's not what everyone does. Um, Correct. Because you, you got me thinking, and I'm, as you were talking, I was having flashbacks because I'm still trying to. I'm wrestling with this, and and I and I, w- I agree. It, it must. It existed. You know, there, there was that element of, of homophobia there. And as we were talking about that, I'm having flashbacks. I, I remember when I was on the, the base, um, you know, my friends and I had no problem hugging each other in public. Um, and then, you know, so guys, you know, give each other a hug when we said goodbye, that kind of thing. Um, and same token, too, we're coming out of the 80s. So some of the clothing there was pretty, you know, flamboyant. And I was, you know, I was I was a bit of an attention seeker where I went to the extreme of having really, really fluoro spandex <laughs> and stuff like that. Right, right. Um and and then and add to that, we went, one of my friends, he um his girlfriend did aerobics. And so there was my friend Jason and another guy, Keith, um, one of our friends and myself, we decided we were going to the aerobics. And now, so I'm going to aerobics dressed in bright fluoro spandex, even with the the, the fluoro wrist. You know, the, you know, the one, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, and and you know, as, as stereotypical as that, you know, to to say that is, you know, the gay type clothing that was perceived there. And you know, that, that I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. And if people want to write comments, go for it. I won't read them. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's but uh, the irony of that was when we walked into the classroom, <laughs> the, the instructor she's gone men and we've gone oh shouldn't we be here? We went to walk out. She goes no, come in, come in. So we, we've gone in and, and we, so we've hit up the back and um and we're up the back and she starts the class and then she ran around to the back and said oh, okay everyone turn around <laughs> and so we put us up the front. But I'm just thinking about that going was I did I was that did people think you know maybe maybe they thought i was gay i don't I, but i, I never maybe they did maybe it did but I, again this is why i'm wondering for that because i never got anything to indicate that that was um that i was being ostracized so that's why i wonder what my, i mean and and maybe my my uh, my personal bias was i just didn't notice it maybe it did happen but i, I just didn't notice or whatever um but that just could be i mean well and uh but now when I look back at it, I'm pretty well. <laughs> God, what was I thinking? <laughs> well, it's, it's funny, too. I can remember in high school, I wanted to take gymnastics. You could take gymnastics mm. or weightlifting mm. in, in school, right? I, and did I did gymnastics in high school. The gymnastics was all girls. Was it? Oh, okay. They didn't have any guys, right? Mm. So I had to go to a counselor to oh. get the to get the opportunity to go. And they're like, are you sure you want to do this? You Not know really. that they're mainly all girls, but they let me, right? I fought for the, here's the funny part. So I get in there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing the gymnastics thing for not even a week. And um, mm. I felt like really uncomfortable. So yeah. I ended up going back to weightlifting after fighting for, <laughs> for the, you know, the, the opportunity well, to, to be in your favor. <laughs> I, yeah, it was yeah. so funny. But well, uh, from my perspective, I went to my secondary school was originally in an all boys school. Um, okay. But the year I went there in year seven was the first year it became co-ed. Um, and but it was it was still dominated by men. Um, but we yeah, we had gymnastics as part of that school. Was, a lot of it was mini tramp type things and, and that kind of stuff. So I don't know, maybe it wasn't real gymnastics. And we used to go around to um primary schools and put on gymnastic shows for them yeah cool. um yeah it was it was a lot of fun it was like you know trying to i could never do a backflip back then um for whatever reason i don't know why i just couldn't couldn't every, well sorry a, yeah backflip i whenever i tried to do it i'd jump and do a somersault as opposed to a backflip um i couldn't i don't know it was something i probably saved work. myself a lot of injuries by by you know <laughs> not doing that but uh yeah that is just interesting because i think of for many years, and I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I have for my whole life, but there was a, a gay bar called The Apartment mm. that was very well, had a cool. cool bar. Called, a friend of mine owned it called The Apartment, but it wasn't a gay bar. It was very classy. Oh, 
those That's two cool. sentences probably shouldn't go. Are you saying that anyway. Gengar, saying <laughs> Gengars are classy? What? Yeah, no, I just didn't realize as that come out. Of that. <laughs> Oops, I'm definitely going to get some hate mail now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but so in this bar has been has been a, a, a fixture in Grand Rapids for a lo- several decades, many many decades, and yeah. originally it was an underground gay bar. Yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah, there was an underground gay bar. There was no mark and no mark, and there still isn't very many markings on the outside of the building. But no markings on the outside of the building, and if you mm-hmm. knew, you knew. Yeah, and if you didn't, you didn't. But mm-hmm. you would go there, and I had some gay friends at the time, and we would go there, and and there'd be people that you would not realize go there because a lot of it was it was good dancing, right? So there's really good dancing and and good music. Yeah, that's and- why I must have been gay because I, I am. Oh, that was my thing. I'd go to nightclubs to dance. That was my aim. I, I wanted right. to get drunk. I just, you know. <laughs> but it was. I guess my point is, is it, it, they felt the need to be underground because mm. because of the environment. Yeah. And and there yeah. was we had a couple. We had a gay bar in Grand Rapids that was called the Carousel, and it mm. burned down twice. Mm. And they never could. They never came out. Uh, <laughs> never came out. Now, 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 as I can think, it was all these, <laughs> these gay cliche things. Uh, but they, they, never, they, they, they never, knew, <laughs> never disclosed if it at least one of the times got burned down by somebody who was was uh, hating homosexuals. Mm. Um, or maybe it was insurance. But they, not, you know, it was very ambiguous on that. So. And we don't know. There's going to be conspiracy theories there as well in those. Circles. Yeah, who knows? I mean, yeah. and it was in a rough part of the neighborhood because it was cheap rent, and uh, but it really was not looked favorably upon. And we uh, and we can probably move on from the whole, I guess, gay topic. But um, <laughs> you think we've moved but here right now. at least in, <laughs> at least from from my experience years ago, I I well, I would say it, there was a a bias towards mm. um, a hatred might not be the right word but i don't think it's too far-fetched but yeah. definitely not accepted as being gay and if you're a, if you're a guy and gay that was not not accepted at all and then later if you remember maybe you guys had this over or your neck of the woods too what this is probably late 90s through the early 2000s i want to say it started in mid late 90s was so this idea of being metro yeah to where you were you were not gay you were a man. You were you were a uh, um, kind of sensitive. Yeah, yeah. You were you were <laughs> you were. Um, you just really nice. <laughs> if you're metro, yeah. But it, it's interesting because I mean, the idea, at least my to to my knowledge of it, like metro was was you were a dude, you were straight, but you were a little bit more. You were sensitive, right? And you yeah. were kind of worldly, but but you were confident and cool with yourself mm. but you weren't the macho type you you know so somewhere between this idea of you know i want to say gay straight guy and a, mm. you know or a, or a straight guy and a gay guy you know metro is like no you're not so it's interesting that we had distinctions for kind of this mm. it's, uh, uh i don't know progress is the right word but but the the gamut of it and things was it, have, was it uh, metrosexual didn't tell fart jokes in public. That was a distinction. So, <laughs> Maybe I <don't> know. <laughs> it was a, a little bit more class there because I, I didn't fit that category. I mean, I dressed nice. People used to think I. I used to I think most of my clothes when I was in my late teens and that not late teens in my early twenties um, came from Kmart and, and things like that, those places. But people used to think, oh, they go, oh, wow. You, you know, I just do the classic, I had the white t-shirt and the, the jeans, but they all, it all came from Kmart and I kind of look like the leader <laughs> type person, you know, with a ja- throw a jacket on. Yeah. Nice. Maybe I was a metrosexual as well. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't even know that you guys had Kmart over in, in Australia. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's owned by a different organization though, I think, from what I understand. Anyway. Um, but yeah, it was just, oh, yeah. yeah, but it just, <laughs> From that side of things, you know, because I look at it you know, again from being manly, um, you know, because when I went out as young, I, I went out to nightclubs to, I mean, sometimes I got drunk, but other times it was, there was a period where I didn't drink um, and I went out to dance and that was my thing. And I used to get up on the stage and I'd be dancing away and having, you know, fun and um, 
Joe's like that. <laughs> it was like, you know, well, they do absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and that's. Uh, and then they had I, this. I was going to say they had the, there was another in Perth where I was at the time. They actually had a ballroom dancing nightclub um, where you actually went there and, and they had, yeah, it was, and they had pro, what they called progressive dances. It wasn't like the new wave type thing, but you actually, you did a routine and then you moved to the next partner. So it was kind of like speed dating. Like speed exercise. dating. Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, that's cool. And it's like you meet someone. Yeah, I oh, took that. Uh, all right, you notice where they were later on when the music stopped, so that you could go over and chat to them later. Yeah, go back to them. No, that'd be great. You know, they. Uh, I took formal dance classes for a little while, like all the, you know, salsa and swing and mm. and some of the not so much of the classics like waltzes and that type of thing, but more the merengue and all this kind of stuff. I really enjoyed it. But yeah, but they had like dance nights to where you could go and basically dance with people and i didn't go to those uh, at the time it was like date night for for myself mm. and the guy that i was dating at the time and we were probably at that point probably in our 30s but it was we had a great time mm. but uh, but i think it all goes back to kind of tie it back into this whole idea of what is manly mm. goes back to your confidence and comfort level mm. inside of you and if we are mentored into that by people that we respect I think it's it's easier to get to that spot. It's mm. harder to find it on your own. I'm not saying you can't. I think there's a lot of people who do find that confidence, that balanced, you know, if I want to say manliness that in a good way. And I think there is some toxic man- masculinity out there, but I don't believe that to be the norm. Um, and I think if we have more well-balanced man mentors who know what you know, man, if you want to say what, what that idea of being a well-balanced, strong man is, I think it's easier to bring that about in other people. Mm. There was a good, there was an interesting uh, situation that occurred. I don't know when, when, when it exactly happened, but it was at a nature reserve to where mm. they had bull elephants. So they had a population of elephants, Mm. And wolves, and you know, and all these, and it was a, it was a, it wasn't a zoo. It was a nature reserve. So, yeah. So what they what they did is at one point they they took away all of the adult male bull elephants. They took them out for mm. some reason. I don't know why? But they took them out of the population. Yeah. And they moved them to a different part of the reserve area, which is apparently you know tens of thousands of acres or more Mm. and what started to occur they they didn't understand at first but some uh, many of the the higher predatorial animals were getting killed Mm. the wolves were getting killed some of the big cats were getting killed and this and they at first they didn't understand what was going on and then they saw that it was the young bull elephants the adolescents that were killing them Mm. which is so out of character and they they were they were perplexed as to why mm. they didn't know why and then somebody had the idea of it's because we took the older bull elephants away mm. so what they did is they transported just out of a, a little bit of experience they transported some of them some of the bull elephants back mm-hmm. and the phenomenon went away all of a sudden now they weren't experiencing these yeah mass deaths of these higher predatorial um, animals from other species. And what they determined was that the young adolescent elephants needed the mentorship of the older bull elephants to keep them in line and to show them how to interact, Mm -hmm. not only within their own herds, but, but within the community of the other animals as well. Yeah. And they very directly kept those young adolescents in place with the bull elephants who would teach them, no, yes, you're a big, you know, you're a big, and the elephants are, you know, kind of top of the food chain as well. Mm. Um, but they didn't know how to use their power. Yeah. And then they needed the mentorship to help them achieve that. Mm. And I think it's no different for up from us. Um, I think we need, we have a much better circumstance when we have strong, balanced leaders that are men 
teaching other men how to be men. <laughs> Do we? And yeah, I, I would agree with that. Do you think we've lost that a little bit too? Because it seems to be, you know, if you have the man group, you it's from some of it I've seen. You know, it's and I know we get to. I mean, from my perspective, some of my friends get together. My, one of my um, best friends, he has a Grand Prix party. Um, has been doing it for over 20 years. We get together on race day and, and do that because we just had that recently. Every now and then, you know, a partner will come, um, never come back again because it's very boys, you know, fighting on people's head, not, you know, metaphorically fighting <laughs> on people's heads. It's, you know, it's it's boys being boys. Um, similar sort of thing. We have a poker night and, and I've you now started taking my son to that. But it is, again, boys, you know, and there's nothing derogatory said about women there at all. We, we you know, we tell gross jokes and stuff like that and, and lots of sledging on each other and, and things like that. Um, and n- nothing mean, but it's, you know, a bit of fun jibing each other, you know, to get a rise out of someone. And then the whole point is you, either you don't get a rise or you, you fire back. Um, and I was a bit concerned when my f- son first was there. Um, I didn't really, because I, I know how old he is, but he looks a lot older. I didn't even factor right. in because I know how old he is. Everyone thought he was 16 or 17. He was 11 the first time we went. Um, and, you know, they, oh, threw, wow. yeah. They, yeah, they threw down with him. Um, and the <laughs> thing was that he threw back. <laughs> and, and he nice. put, quote, unquote, fat Jesus in his place as he put, as he called him. <laughs> <laughs> and well, and, and I, he fired back with, you know, with fat, two fat Jesus. And everyone, because he looked this big guy with beard, and it just looked like, and everyone just lost it. And I was like, okay, he knows how to. But do you think guys need that? We need to have that, as you say, that the the old bulls around, the old elephant bulls need the the young ones need the old ones around. We need that man time, and that man time is good. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And we need the balance time too, right? We need. We also do need the time with the mothers and the. And oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. But we absolutely need the time with the men. And, and also like in those situations, I think, and to also have, here's where it turns toxic, I think is when, when you don't have one or more of the guys know when enough is enough. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, so you throw the fat Jesus joke out there and then the fat Jesus would have came back with something even more scathing. And then the other one comes up higher. And at some point somebody's like, well, okay, you know, let's, let's bring Mm. it back down to fun ribbing each other yeah. or like rough house, rough housing. And I just, I've got to research this more. Maybe some of your listeners out there can, can uh, shoot us some information on this, but I believe they just did a study. They, I don't know who they are, but some Harvard or Princeton or one of these uh, American academic mm. uh, concerns did a research study about young men, boys, and rough housing, physical rough housing, and how important it is, and what it does for their development, and that it's mm. necessary. Um, or a, another one, I know they've done a lot of research on this. But this is more more for both men and women, or young young boys and girls. But this idea of exercise and cognitive learning, mm. and how important it is. And unfortunately, one of the first things that gets cut in schools over here, anyways, is like recess and gym class. As if it's not necessary, you know, no, it's like, you get some more hate mail here, but it's like a dog, right? You, you run the dog until the little puppy until they're tired and then they pay attention more. Yeah. And kids are the same way, right? It's like ADHD. Okay. Maybe you need medication. Maybe you don't, but first, why don't we do this? Why don't we run the shit out of them out in the playground? <laughs> right. That's why my son, there. I sent him to do karate because he wouldn't sit still. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And because his focus is, you know, I mean, yeah. Same thing with depression, right? They they are doing all these research studies right now on ADHD and and depression and anxiety and how physical activity will help to stave off a lot of that. Um, well, I mean, I know I know many psychiatrists will say, and psychologists um, who've said, you, know, you can't be depressed if you're active. Um, it's Much harder to. mutually exclusive. Now, obviously, there's a time when you've got to rest, and there's some, you know, right, right. and and there's something like that. But uh, same token, and uh, said so there are, you know, there is medical help that's needed. Yes, and no, we're certainly not saying that. Um, I, you know, it's, but there is. I remember because I had that um, an employee who I was going to fire because this person had. I remember. 
yeah so and so we went through that process um and it's there's something to be said about you know having a a a grateful attitude being gratitude making a difference and and physical exercise those two factors make a massive difference um absolutely and and i think being you know like back to our discussion about the the man groups and all that um Mm. you know i think they're like in the states here we have boy scouts and girl scouts and i think they need to be separate Mm. i'm just wondering you could just i think you could have a third faction of just scouts if you want to do a co-ed thing I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So you could have a choice, but I, I also think that there needs to be just like with women, right? There are certain things that women you need to get in the, the circle of of um, you know mm-hmm. gals to show you know women how to be women and to hang out as gals, absolutely, and and also with guys to hang out with guys. And and I think there needs to be obviously the, the mix of them coming together too, but. There is a huge need for a guy to be a guy and to learn how to do that in a balanced, respectful way. But it's different than being a woman. I mean, it just is. Yeah, because I, I, I really starting to appreciate so when I was younger, I played lawn bowls and, and golf with my dad. Um, but initially I went with my dad, but then I got separated off. So my dad would go and play with his friends and I'd go and play with a bunch of other guys as part of, you know, the, the group that they went with. It was, a, you know, the golf was a social golf club. So you go to different clubs around and I'd pair uh, or quad up with, you know, three other guys and go around the 18 holes with them. Um, and same with lawn bowls. It was the same sort of thing where I'd go off and, and you know, go with my dad to it. But then I'd be in a, a team with a bunch of guys. But I, I really, really starting to appreciate now that mentorship that I got without even realizing it um, about, as you said, this respect, um, treating people appropriately, that was all there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was just wondering how we bring that back again because it seems to be missing a little bit. Um, so I'm not sure how we – It is. Again, I think it comes back to more podcasts and radio shows like this. Mm. Or men like yourself and men, probably many of the others out there listening to this to lead from the front mm. and when you have an opportunity to mentor, mentor. And the same thing with the women. So with the women, it's like there's there's many women that I know that see the need for the man mentoring. So they they create a, a situation to where they're young man you know their son or whatever gets the opportunity with a man Mm. gets the opportunity to do man things and boy things yeah where does Um, that it's important yeah definitely from from that side of things we're going to take that a step further where do we fit um the stoicism in there i mean they talk about toxic masculinity and and men you know being stoic and and not you know, expressing feelings. Um, you know, where where do you draw the line? Is to, I know when my son was younger and he fell over, and it's like, you know, come on, get up, you're all right, no problem. And you know, and then you know, another time we were skiing and and he fell over, and it's like, this really hurts. And it's like, okay, closer look. Oh uh, yeah, you've broken your leg. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe we get <laughs> put the skis up and and you get you know, get the 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 green whistle as it is. Um, but see, but you're sensitive to it, right? So you you were sensitive to it because mm. I tend to tend to be the walk it off kind of guy too. Mm. But but I'm also sensitive enough to to reconsider that and to pull and then to pull back and to know you know um, mm. to be empathetic towards it as well. So not to overcomplicate it, or to, I, I know I'm acting as a broken record here, but. It's about the balance and being sensitive to to that of getting feedback and then not being so full of your own ego and so or 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 the other way to afraid and deny yourself those feelings, but finding that balance. Because that, I mean, to me, yeah, I mean, we're we're talking the same thing, and it's. And I'm just wondering where that fits because, it, and I and I've heard a number of you know sports people talk about how you know when they grew up, um, you know famous sports people in Australia, you know, now 
guys talking about, oh, you know, taught not to ask for help, not to express emotions. Um, and to me, that just seems really foreign because I had no problem asking for help. Um, and, you know, I learned quickly that you've got to be careful who you ask for help because some people Absolutely. <laughs> um, don't give great advice and you, you want to have a safe group to, to ask for help. But same token too, you know, I still want to work things out myself. But if I'm stuck for something, um, and that's where I got some great mentors because I went and said, hey, you know, can you give me some advice on this? And it was amazing how many people would actually give you advice. Um, right. And so just from that, but where do we draw the line from that side of things? When do, Where do you become a namby-pamby, so to speak, as opposed to, you know, someone that, that needs genuine help? How do you know the difference? Or how can we advise people to know the difference? Well, you, you have to be sensitive to the circumstance, and mm. and that and that's part of the issue I think that we have is everything is right now in in today's day and age everything seems to be so subjective, mm. and like anything goes. So there's lack of structure of well, what what is that balance then? No. You know, and you can start making really general, large, reaching examples to try to start to surmise that idea of what of what the balance point is and it's going to be different right like your balance point this is why the idea of you know having a relationship to where one there's more of a masculine and more of a feminine um individual to to balance the the in this case the child child rearing read read the kid out like mm -hmm. i have a lot of tendencies that are like my mother mm -hmm. but i also have a lot of tendencies that are like my father Mm. And I'm a man now. If I would have been a woman, if I would have, if I would have been, uh, you know, a girl growing up, and then a woman, I'm sure I would still have had those tendencies, you know, for both from both of my parents. Yeah. But being that my biology is would have been different, I, you know, would I would be a different person. I would have assimilated those those uh, influences differently. Mm. But but I have a lot of tendencies that are are my mother's, and then I have a lot of tendencies that are my dad's. Hmm. Um, so that balance is 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 huge, and which brings us to another point that I guess we could talk about for five hours <laughs> is uh, the family structure, hmm. right? Having fatherless families which mm -hmm. is a huge problem in the united states for everything from mental health issues to crime to violence to all this stuff that you have predominantly absent fathers mm -hmm. not as much absent fathers, but predominantly absent fathers in a lot of these households so these young men are being raised by their mothers bless their hearts you know and or grandparents um but without that male figure, the and this, this, not there. this is the, the statistic speaking, not me mm. speaking, but statistically, they struggle. Mm. Those young men struggle. And that is, if you look at the, the history of violence, the history of mental health, the history of crime and problems, it, when it comes to men, a lot of the time they are coming from broken families do we need you know again coming back to those men's groups so to speak um we either you know sort you know give people the, the skill to to be better at choosing how they start a relationship or who they choose to start a relationship with um so that people stay together or you know because you want to have a relationship where you know the people aren't it's better not to be together well in my opinion right. If you know, sure. if, you, if you've got a toxic relationship, you know, <laughs> and, it's, and you're always at each other's throat, um, metaphorically yeah, that's speaking, either. yeah, it's that's not a good example for children. Um, but do we need again? How, I mean, how if we've got that situation where you know, because and I know you know, I've got family members where you, the guy just pissed off and left um, the children, so he's never, never there. Um, how do you, I mean, how do we give those young men guidance or young boys guidance? 
back to because because here's the thing too like you and i we can't dictate if stan family stay together no. you know that yeah, it's beyond our pay grade we can advocate we can we can research we can do a lot of things but you know we're you and i as individuals cannot make a difference individually other than you know a small ripple which which not is not that that's bad but you know I, butterfly thing. You, I can't you can't <laughs> make one you know gesture to fix that problem but yeah. none, none of your listeners can either right but what we can do is make ourselves available lead from the front make ourselves available to people who are, are open for that relationship be a mentor it does not mean you know be a preacher mm. but back down to that same thing in in the united states we have a program called big brothers big sisters where you can mm. you can become a big brother of usually they're foster kids or kids that have lost their their father in some way but they have to obviously be in a program mm. and uh and then you donate i don't know how you know, it's a few uh, i think it's every other week or, or the other weekend you take them for a day and uh and you you mentor them and that can make all the difference right mm. or it could be a martial artist right you're a martial arts instructor i've got you know in my academy i have several young people that i mentor um mm. And sometimes not so young people that I mentor with, <laughs> because we all, let's all face it, this isn't just for for kids. We yeah. we I have people that I mentor under. I just talked to one of my Jack mm-hmm. Hoban, one of my friends and mentors, uh, who's a few steps ahead of me. You know, we just talked last week. He lives in Hawaii um, yeah. at this point, and uh, and I still keep in touch with him. I still visit with him. I still train with him. Another one, actually, his name's Bob Bars. Um, he was one of my first martial arts instructors after my father. So I've known him since I was like nine years old mm. and, uh, and he's been a huge mentor much of my life. Matter of fact, when I was 22, um, I worked for him. He hired me at, when I was out of college, out of university and, uh, I worked for him for a, a couple of years and, uh, he and I had a fall, a huge falling out yeah. over, over something. And we didn't talk for almost 10 years. Wow. And because I didn't, you know, I didn't respect him for certain things. And we, we just had this, uh, this fissure over ethics and so we had a falling out and then we bumped into each other at a downtown like coffee house or something years and years later. And, and we were both in a better spot. We got together for lunch and we rekindled that, that, um, that relationship and that was probably 20 some odd years ago now and we've we stay in touch and i consider him he's uh pushing 70 now i think he's 68 so i'm 52 mm. so he's like 15 plus years older than i am and i still consider him a, a close friend and a mentor uh, of mine so you still have mentors no matter what age you're you're in mm. and some of them might be formal some of them may be informal yeah, my dad, you know, my father is still my mentor. Um, mm. Doesn't mean these men are perfect, mm. but uh, they're humans. But they have a lot of a lot of things that we can still learn, and we, in turn, have to take on the responsibility of being mentors ourselves too. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. shy away from it. Stand up when when it's time to stand up, and, mm. and not in a boisterous way, but in a very balanced way, and. You know, the golden rule, you know, treat people like you want to be treated. And a lot of these fundamental things, you know, most could least harm, you know, but Mm. a lot of these fundamental things that that we struggle with as human beings at whatever age we are. However, don't cut yourself short. Lead from the front. And if you can help, help. Mm. And when you see someone that, you know, maybe could use an encouraging word or kick in the ass. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it, need it needs to be both it needs to be both right I just, but do it do it gently and do it from the right re, do it for the right reasons right yeah i had this experience um just recent very recently in the past few weeks um with my dad uh, my dad and i you know we, we get along really well um now you know, we, similar to yourself we, there was a period there where we didn't <laughs> and um, sure. you know <laughs> But you know, we have for a long time and you know, we tell each other, you know, love you and, and give each other every time we see each other, give each other a hug, um, public or wherever. Not not fast about that. That's just what we do. Um, but it was funny, we were at a um 
uh, I caught up with my dad near home, well, yeah, not hometown, but in a local town where near where I grew up. And it was at a, a club or a pub sort of environment. And some of his older friends that he actually, you know, went to apprenticeship with. So he's known, you know, my dad's similar to age to your dad. Um, so from an apprenticeship when he was 17, he's, that's, you know, he's known these people for, you know, 50 odd years, nearly 60 years. Right. Um, so we're sitting there having this this chat and talking and things like that, and um, and for what I was normally I, I don't even why I think about it. Um, I went to I was going and I just went to walk off, um, and my dad is oi, give us a hug, and so I walked over and, and you know give him a hug. But one of his mates said oi, what are you doing? You know, and my dad turned and said he's my son. I can give him a hug, and and you know and it was like. I mean, he said it more forcefully than that. But anyway, um, I did yeah, a good replication. Of that. Like he was just going, "No, this is this is what we do," um, and it was just. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Um, you know, the, just from that whole mentor thing where my dad was, because I would normally just stand up and do that. But I, you know, my my dad was like, "No, you know, put you in your place, mate. It's like you're an old friend, but <laughs> this is how we do things." Um, that's and that's what we're talking about right it's yeah. and he did it in a, i'm sure a respectful enough way maybe you know oh but yeah no, there's no big issue there at all from the other right. i think i don't know what the other guy i haven't seen that guy since um because it was only a few weeks ago anyway um but you know and my dad's not one for worrying about what other people think anyway um so it was just a it was what you're talking about there is maybe, and that's just what we need to be doing is, is, you know, the, uh, rewriting that narrative of, you know, yes, there's a few people out there that, you know, but they're, they're not, that's not the mainstream. That's not the norm um, is what I'd like to say, I guess, from that perspective. It's certainly not, you know, I think in today's society, we've moved beyond that and we need to be standing up against that voice that, or that squawking, I'm going to call it squawking. <laughs> which is not a lot a, of squawking <laughs> yeah it's but it is it's as you say is it get, you know out of a thousand people two people will be complaining and it, it'll be you know, well that's not you know and it, it's probably more than a thousand that you know that there's a couple of people just making a lot of noise and and we're getting distracted by that we need to i mean i think that's what manly is is this quiet confidence um absolutely the quiet confident to me the the idea of being manly was quiet confidence being confident in your in your in yourself and in your abilities to not, not have to prove anything to anyone and to stand up for folks who can't stand up for themselves and not to do it in a way to because i want to feed my ego but do it in a way that there's a circumstance or someone that i can help and i can i can do it for for them out of love and respect and the same thing holds true if I see somebody acting out of line that I'm going to stand up and, and tell them in a hopefully balanced, respectful way. It's like, no, it's like your dad did with, you know, um, with the guy who's kind of poking fun at you. It's like, no, he's my son. I'm going to, of course, I'm going to hug him. And Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I didn't relay in my um, my rendition and my poor acting. <laughs> that was, yeah. actually, it was, it was love and respect. That was, yeah. that was what he conveyed. Um, I, I love that you said, because yeah, I hadn't. That, but that's exactly what he conveyed. That was how it came across. Um, and that Well, we've got to, I think we, when we kick people in the rear end because they need to or say something, if you do it with the intent of, I'm, I'm trying to help you. And mm -hmm. I've had these kind of direct conversations with guys before, right, mm -hmm. to where they think I'm coming down on them. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the academy just recently had a situation where – there was a guy who was, how do you want to say, um, he was using his physicality too much in class. Yeah. Right. And I pulled him aside and I said, hey, man, I've talked to you about this several times. Hmm. You need to take it down a few notches. Hmm. And he got all you know quiet and all that. And I said, I'm not saying this. I'm saying this because I love you and I'm saying this because I'm trying to help you out. Mm. But if you keep going, there's going to be an issue and I don't want there to be an issue. Mm. So you need to learn to take it down a few steps. You know, I didn't say it to be mean. Mm. But we need, I think guys, 
need those boundaries. I know from my son's perspective, when I look at it, he had a lot of freedom um, in what he did, did, but he also had boundaries. And same to- I mean, I ask him all the time, take the rubbish out and do things like that. No question about it. He just does it now. Um, you know, sometimes I might have to ask a couple of times because he's focused <laughs> on what he's doing. Right. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, do we, I think, and part of that being manly is, is we need those those boundaries as well. Young guys need, like you said, with the old bulls, the old elephant bulls, that they, they, they help set the boundaries for the younger younger ones. Um, Absolutely, do I mean if you look at the, it can be too too gung ho or too gun shy again. You want you mm-hmm. want to strike and find that balance within yourself, and then mentor that outwardly as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the best coaches I know, they'll hold you to task. But also, you know, they're, they're empathetic and balanced enough to know when enough is enough. Mm. Yeah, I love that. We've talked for a while now. <laughs> Long <enough. laughs> Again. <laughs> it's after midnight at my time. Um, Jeez, yeah. Yeah, but it's been, I mean, we could talk forever on this, but it, it's, I mean, if we sum it up, I mean, it seems to be coming back to this whole quiet confidence, love and respect. Is that you know if we put that as an overarching thing to to what is manly that this is you know something we need to share with guys? It's you know be confident, know who you are, be confident in that, and act with love and respect. Yes, and I would say you know for some action steps, get in a martial arts class, <laughs> Re, right? Research. Get, get into a sport, get into a martial arts class, something that resonates with you, that you have a coach and you have, you know, there's some physicality involved and research some of these old classics mm. stories. There is a. Um, there's a lot of good, I, I think, people out there who want to do the right thing. Mm. If you if you're one of those people, make sure you lead from the front. Mm. And when you see an opportunity to mentor, do it. Mm. You know, it doesn't have to be official, but ask that young man or or just man who's struggling, right? Or somebody who you see, get together with them, meet them mm. for coffee, go shoot hoops with them, or do whatever it is that you do, and talk and talk and be real. Yeah, and be authentic and I will I guess I'll close my closing statement up with this I'll use Dr. Robert Humphrey who is my mentor's mentor you heard Mm. me talk about Jack Oban it was his mentor yeah and if you've heard any of the other podcasts that we've talked in together I probably said this before but the idea go ahead sorry (laughs) no that's good the idea of for me is the warrior's creed Wherever you go, everyone's a little bit safer because you're there. Wherever you are, anyone you need as a friend. And whenever you go home, people are glad that you're there. That, to me, encapsulates the idea of being a strong, balanced individual. Now, obviously, that could be for men or women, but we're talking about men right now. So be a man mm. of honor. Yeah. Be a man of respect. Be a man of humility. Be strong in your convictions, but also be compassionate. Yeah, I love that. And I was like, when you mentioned say do martial arts, I, I laughed there, and I, and I wasn't. Um, I was <laughs> laughing. I was laughing because so many people have said that. It's in talking with people on this topic. So many people that even have nothing to do with martial arts have said, you know, martial arts will give you a good grounding. Um, well, and, and I would say some of the traditional martial arts too, right? Um, even though, like, I, I believe you took Aikido or you take Aikido, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Oh. So Aikido, you know, regardless of whatever slant that people have about, well, this is more effective or that's more effective. Oh, I've done many, but that. that's the current one. <laughs> kind of doing it. <laughs> nice. It's time to go. But I've got it. I just practice at home. But <laughs> That's cool. But, but yeah, fine, kind of, tai, fine, sometimes fine, the, taekwondo, kung fu, a um, little bit of ninjutsu in there as well. <laughs> I'll, nice. I like, I love the throwing stars that way. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and regardless if it's a formalized or, or or more traditional system or not, I think there's still that heart of being that that valiant warrior. Mm. The idea of the the chivalry or the idea we talked we talked in other episodes about the the kanji of warrior was a, you know a broken spear meaning one who prevents war yeah. one who's willing to go to war to prevent more violence from happening yeah. you know wherever you go everyone everyone's a little bit safer because you're there wherever you walk you know this idea of what i call being a peace walker you know we train so we can walk in peace mm. but you got to be you got to be ready to throw down outside of yourself but also you got to be ready to throw it out inside of yourself to tackle those fears that you have to tackle those insecurities that you have and if we can help each other out to 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 shed light on some of the way and the perspective you know the leaders you got to lead from example you got to lead from the front yeah exactly exactly craig it has been wonderful chatting with you as always (laughs) it's so exciting it's so much to I, I learned so much um, from that, but I, I really appreciate the frank openness as well. And I'm pretty sure people will take that for for what that is. Um, you know, and those that don't, well, they don't. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to read the comments anyway. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but um, I do appreciate that you know you actually you know having that courage, and I know you're a, a strong, courageous guy to to actually have that courage to have these conversations and and go to the places that we did so thank you for that i I really am blessed that you you did that damien thank you so much for having me on i really appreciate the conversation and uh, i learn i think more from you than you do me and hopefully your your listeners will get something out of this conversation if i can be of any help to you or anyone else please feel free to contact me Uh, i'm sure you'll have my information on your site um so you can yeah, put all your details in the show notes exactly as yeah yeah so if i can be of any help um same thing if you want to those trollers out there if you want to troll i don't really care keep it to yourselves right move on <laughs> come and get some help we'll we'll train with you yeah <laughs> yeah there you go some free coupons exactly. yeah <laughs> we'd love to i mean i'd love to have those conversations to be honest rather than you yeah. know behind closed doors clicking keyboards let's have a conversation Absolutely. Let's throw it out. Thank you again. (laughs) In a respectful way. (laughs) In a respectful way. Exactly. Greg, thank you very much. Chat to you again soon. Sounds good, Damien. Thanks, man. Thank you for being part of the Share.Care community and helping people around the world prosper. You're creating a bigger pie for everyone to share. The more people contributing to the world being a better place, the better the world becomes for others and for you.